Good morning and welcome. It's Easter. And we're glad to be together. We're glad to be the people of God gathering in Jesus' name, celebrating this day that's changed history forever and changed us forever. Amen? Amen. Hear these words from Psalms. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in his eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. Friends, he has risen. One more time. The Lord has risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. Well, those are my favorite seven minutes out of the whole year. It's so beautiful. Thank you, music team. And as we enter into a time of prayer, prayer is just us throwing open the windows to our lives to invite God in, the light of the world, into every corner of our life. So please join me in prayer. God, today is the day, the day we celebrate your good news, that Jesus is alive, that you have victory over death, that hope is here. Yet it was only a few days ago when we remembered Jesus' death and the pain, the grief, the darkness. And for some of us, God, we're still there. The pain we carry is still too heavy. The grief of loss overwhelming, the loneliness, the fear. How do we celebrate resurrection when there is so much destruction in our lives and the world? But yet, God, today on this Easter morning, you remind us again, Jesus was raised from the grave. The tomb is empty. You had a plan. You made a way. You kept your promise then, and you keep your promises today. That even when we feel trapped, like we're the one living in a tomb, you are coming, and there is no stone that you cannot roll away, God. No tomb that cannot be opened. So God, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hands, open our minds, and open our hearts. Because you are not just the resurrected Jesus, you are the resurrecting God, whose work of resurrection was not done so many years ago, but continues today to offer each of us new life and renewed love every day. May we grab hold of that, God. May we listen to your voice, that same voice who called Jesus to rise up is calling out to each of us today. May it become so true for us that we not only believe in your story of resurrection, but we practice it daily. And may we bear witness to your transformative power in our lives. But it's not easy, God. So give us the courage to trust in the hope that we celebrate today. And God, we're mindful of the people in our midst who need your transformative power. We pray on their behalf for healing, for Jeannie Mastain and Patty Brufolt. Heal them, care for them, lift up their caretakers. And God, we pray for healing for all those we are thinking about silently right now as well. And God, we pray for comfort for Tom Cooner and family at the death of his brother Dave, for Don Hutchinson and family 
at the death of his brother Bob, for Adam Cole and family at the death of his mother Rita, and for Diane Getch and family at the death of her husband Dave. God, we know that you know what it is to grieve. So comfort them and their loved ones in the way that only you can. And may we be your hands and feet in these moments and seasons as well. And now, God, together we unify in voice around the prayer you taught your disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Wonderful day of celebration. This, we know, is the week that was. We had things going on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yesterday morning, and now, of course, today. And we're glad that you're part of it. Yesterday morning, we have hundreds of kids and their families. Actually, rather than me telling you about it, let, let's show you what it was like.
I was there also, and they did let me pet the animals, but I couldn't go on the bouncy gym. <laughs> Apparently, I was over the age limit and the weight limit, but maybe next year I can sneak in. Hey, we have a service project coming up this Wednesday. We're going to create uh, care packets during dinner on Wednesday evening. Then afterwards, we're going to hear three speakers about different organizations that we support that are reaching out to young adults in our community. So come Wednesday night, participate in that. You can see them, the packets that we'll be putting together at the Connection Corner after the service today. Do you remember the first time you heard the expression fake news and all that would go along with that, coming and going both sides? Well, we have a speaker on April 18th, Faith and Justice, it's Rachel Whiteman, and uh, she's an author of Faith and Fake News, A Guide to Consuming Information Wisely. So that should be a fascinating talk and a great reminder for us as we head into these coming months. Paul, you have, have uh, something to tell us about the hymnals, the newer hymnals that we have. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Paul Rudoy. I'm the director of the Corral upstairs. Um, and I wanted to uh, let you know that the hymnals are a couple years old officially in the congregation, but we had a bunch of you who decided that you wanted to donate to support our new hymnals and also to donate in honor of or in tribute of someone. Well, we finally have those hymnals with the stickers inside for the people you donated to and tributed to. So those can be found right next to the music center, right down the hall over here on the right. There's a table and it's alphabetical so you can find the hymn and hymnal that you want, ideally the one that you purchased, and then you can put it wherever you'd like within the meeting house here so that you can come back to it every week as you return for worship. I also had another quick thing to note. If you turn in your bulletin to the offertory, you'll see that it says the Alleluia. That is the Alleluia that we sing all the time at high points in the year that we've done year, uh, for years, but there's a little note there that if you want to sing the Hallelujah Chorus with the chorale, you can head up during the offertory. But a note that all of you have no excuse now because you have the Hallelujah Chorus in your bulletin. So all of you can sing with us for our final song, the Hallelujah Chorus. Feel free to join us up in the loft, or you can stay seated and look in your insert. Thank you so much. I, I actually have my separate, you know, area with singing, I, I hum along. <laughs> and you're welcome to do that with me also. One last announcement, uh, the alternative service has been working along with us, the traditional and the alternative for the last couple of years. Well, we're kind of recalibrating that and saying, what, what will that be like in the future? And so we'd like you to give us some feedback and that's the Connection Corner again. is a survey that you can fill out. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you like, didn't like, what you'd suggest, and if you'd like to be involved in planning that service. So let us know your feedback and we'll appreciate that a great deal. Now, our kids are going to God's Garden. God's Garden, as most of us know, is uh, children's programming, help kids learn about Jesus Christ and the welcome that uh, we all have through Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul's gonna lead us now in the song, Come to the Garden. All right, kids, let's head on over. Let's all sing the God Garden song. Let's do it. Ready? Come, oh come, come to the garden. the door let's all say loudly have fun kids ready have fun kids have a blast you got a fireman in the house <laughs> i love the way the kids are always so purposeful in how they head out makes me want to go with them but we'll let them go well invite you to stand now and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
Hey, good morning. Peace of Christ to you. City of Duluth. Are you from Duluth? The word of the Lord today is from Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Taking the spices that they had prepared, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them, the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. 
But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he, then he went home amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord. As the note in the pulpit underneath my glass of water says, oh Lord, it is Easter and you have risen. We have come to celebrate the 2,000th some anniversary of that day that transformed it all. But we still need your leading, your guiding, your transformation in each of our hearts. And so come, speak to us through the words that you've placed on my heart that we might leave this place empowered, emboldened, filled to overflowing, that we make sure the love you have given us in Jesus to the world. We pray this in your name. Amen. I got to calm down. My heart is racing because I am here with all of you today. It's Easter and there's no better day, as Nicole prayed, there's no better day to gather with God's people on Easter because there's no better message that we have an eternal hope that we can know now and is reserved for us in glory. So as senior minister of Meeting House Church, I want to take this moment to thank every one of you for choosing to spend Easter morning with us in person or streaming. And if you're streaming with us today, I want to especially look at the camera and say to you, some of us have talked, some of us have been encouraged that you will be watching us today. And I want you to know, we know that, we believe that, we see you, and we love you. So thank you for joining us via Zoom. Whether you've been coming to this church your whole life, so far, this, or if this is your first time, or it's Easter and you're just here, we're so glad. We're so glad that you've come because Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the beautiful day to celebrate the most significant event in history. It does, however, seem strange to talk about good days in a season where it's easy for us to feel things are unknown, uncertain, where there are times filled with anxiety and fear and loss. This is all the more reason, I believe, to ponder the Easter message and the hope it promises. I heard about a little boy sitting beside his friend at church one Easter Sunday. His friend asked, how'd you get that bruise on your arm? The boy replied, I ate some Easter candy. His friend said, Easter candy won't give you a bruise. The boy quipped, it will if it's your big sister's candy. (laughs) I heard another one about two brothers getting ready to boil some eggs to color them for Easter. I'll give you $10 if you let me break three of these on your head, the older brother said to the younger. $10? Mm -hmm. Promise? Promise. I promise. Gleefully, the older boy broke the first egg over his brother's head, and then another. The younger brother braced himself 
for that last egg. But nothing happened. Are you going to break the third egg, the boy asked, of his older brother? At which his older brother replied, nah, if I did that, I'd owe you $10. Life can be full of empty promises. Often if something sounds too good to be true, well, it probably is. So we won't find our hope in empty promises. So what hope will interrupt our human understanding and bring us to a place where we can cry out, Alleluia, to God, and know, and know he cares. As many of you know, A couple of decades ago, I was the youth pastor at this church. I did it for 13 years. Lots of mission trips and ski trips and trips around the cities. So forgive me as I share one of the many ways we entertained ourselves on some of those long van rides. They're called Minute Mysteries. Do you know about these? Here's an example. A man lives on the 10th floor of a building. He takes the elevator to the ground floor every day to leave this building. When he returns home, he takes the elevator to the 6th floor and walks up the stairs to reach his apartment on the 10th floor. He does this every day, unless it's raining. If it's raining, he rides the elevator to the 10th floor. Why does he do this? Here's another one. (laughs) Anthony and Cleopatra are lying dead on the floor of a villa in Egypt. The window was open with glass and water all over the floor. There are no marks on either Anthony or Cleopatra, and they have not been poisoned. How did they die? Yet another one. A man rode into town on Friday, stayed for three nights, and left on Friday. How's that possible? You figured that one out already. The man rode a horse named Friday. Did you ever play these kinds of games, these mind puzzles? Now, some of you might sit for hours to try to figure those out now. Others will wonder, who thought these up and how do they have so much free time? (laughs) Especially when you hear the answers. I'll tell you the answers. So you won't be trying to figure them out during my sermon. Or for the rest of the morning. In the first case, you remember that one about the elevator ride? In the first case, the man would only go to the sixth floor on his return home because... It was the highest button he could reach on the elevator control panel. He was a very short man. On the days it was raining, he had his umbrella. So he could use the umbrella to punch the button that would send him to the 10th floor. That could take an easy hour in a van ride to figure that one out. (laughs) You remember about the water and the glass on the floor and the open window? In the second situation, it might help you to know that Anthony and Cleopatra are goldfish. The cat, Boots, knocked over the fishbowl, jumping out the window, which broke and spilled water all over the floor. Now that you've got the hang of it, let's try one more. On Friday night, a man died, and that same night was buried. On Sunday morning, his friends arrived at the grave only to discover his body is gone. What happened? We recognize that story, don't we? One of the problems with Jesus' resurrection is that some try to make sense of everything that happened that day as if it were a riddle to figure out. They try to understand precisely what happened and how Jesus could die and then come back to life again. Let me tell you something. But it's a secret. So I'm going to whisper it. None of it does make sense. Now you're wondering what in the world I'm talking about, aren't you? 
Why would I say that? But think about it from your rational, logical, analytical perspective. Does it make sense that a person can be dead for three days and come back to life? No. No, it doesn't. But we wouldn't be here on Easter morning if we weren't trying to make sense of it, would we? Let me ask you. How much of life does make sense to you right now? How much are you able to figure it out? Do we wonder where God is in all the complexities of the world? Wars in Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, and other places on this crowded planet? Innocent lives living in hunger, fear, and uncertainty. Social unrest. Caustic political division. And financial insecurity are the norm for many. So what is God doing in these and many other situations in our hearts this morning? And if we who decide to confront these questions, these puzzles, with a different heart, a Jesus-centered heart, what are we to do? At times, the church has lots of questions and sometimes not a lot of answers that we like. Yet I declare to you today, Easter 2024, we can have hope and a promise that if we would cry out, God will offer us a way forward. I truly believe the answers are in the hope that comes to us in the empty tomb, God's love, God's faithfulness, and God's resurrected son, Jesus. Can I get an Easter amen for that? Amen. It can be easy to disbelieve who Jesus is and what has been proclaimed he did because we can't see the physical evidence. We can't see the things that we want to see and truly, absolutely, with certainty know the evidence of his resurrection. We weren't there, so how can we know? How can we prove there was a resurrection? Physically, we can't. And so humanity has many reasons for not believing in this, wait for it, miracle. Miracle. God's unexplained entrances into this world. Like my friend Craig, who works at my, yes, I said that, holiday gas station, <laughs> with whom I've had many conversations about faith, especially this conversation, he told me once and has told me a couple of times since that he would believe the story of Easter if I could prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Are you sitting here today thinking, I understand where Craig is coming from. I told my friend I couldn't prove Jesus rose from the dead. So if the only way you will believe is to see the physical evidence of the resurrection, then you'll be so disappointed. I cannot give it to you because it's a faith thing. I know that is an empty answer at times, but it is. It is a faith thing. As one author said, it's the logical leap into the darkness. And that can be hard. I stumbled upon a, a book that I read a number of years ago. Charles Coulson's book from several years ago, The, the Faith. The former counsel of President Nixon, the convicted conspirator in the Watergate scandal, wrote that the Watergate cover-up was the final straw convincing him Jesus was raised from the dead. He wrote, there were only eight or ten of us in that inner circle around the president who knew what was going on. All we had to do was stonewall for a couple of months and the Watergate scandal would be over. We had all the power and prestige of the presidency at our fingertips. And if the truth broke, there would be an embarrassment and perhaps a prison sentence. There was no grave danger. Our lives were not threatened, but we couldn't hold the conspiracy, but we couldn't hold the conspiracy together for more than three weeks. We could not contain the lie. Once prosecutors 
Once prosecution was possible, the instincts of self-preservation were so overwhelming that one by one, the conspirators caved in and stood in line at the prosecutor's office to escape jail. Colson concluded, I know that the disciples could not perpetuate a lie like the resurrection because it was just, when it was just, because it was not just their reputation that was at stake. Their lives were literally in danger. They had no clout. They had nothing to gain by the lie. Yet every one of them stood fast in their conviction that Jesus was alive. Take it from one who saw firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up is. Nothing less than a witness as awesome as the resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and he is Lord. Add to this that each apostle except for John died a martyr's death for this message. They died rather than recant their belief in the resurrection. Friends, I don't believe the disciples would have died for a lie. History has shown people will give their lives for what they believe is true, but for what they know is false now. So when it comes to believing in the resurrection of Jesus, we cannot merely seek knowledge. Instead, we must pursue faith. In doing so, we can watch then for transformed lives, maybe even our own. We can cry out to a God who hears our prayers and will empower our faith if we ask. I think some follow Jesus because of their knowledge of him. But it must ultimately be our hearts that pulls us into a relationship with Jesus. Which can provide then the confidence we need to follow. The Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Romans... If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you will find hope. Do we understand where our beliefs come from? It comes from our hearts. The heart is the source of all that we long for. It's the place where we make some of the most important and significant decisions. Our hearts can lead us to the resurrected Jesus if we're willing If we're willing to let down the defenses we create to protect ourselves from what we think might disappoint or hurt. What if this Easter we choose to believe what the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel proclaimed? God said, if you ask, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you. You see, our hearts matter to God. They are the source of all meaningful life. So my friends, let's look to God with our hearts and let down the walls that keeps us from experiencing the life God longs for us to experience. Let's receive together the hope healing, joy, peace, and grace-filled love the creator of the universe has for us all. Might we, might we this Easter allow this for the first time or once again to happen in our lives? Friends, we can know this hope applies to all of us. Whether we have known Jesus for years or are still searching, by allowing our hearts to be open, to be open to the love of God, a God who has come to us in Jesus, that we might know that. For it's then we will experience God's hope, a hope that interrupts the feeble hope that the world offers. I love what Luke tells us in verse 11. The women told the disciples what had happened, but the story sounded nonsense, so they didn't believe. Even though the disciples lived with Jesus for three years, they still didn't get it. To think that Jesus really was resurrected would have blown their minds, I guess. 
What they assumed to be reality wasn't. It didn't make sense. Yet it was a reality for the disciples and can be a reality for us. Jesus has risen, people, from the dead. That's the good news of the gospel story that brings us to this place year after year. So maybe you need a fresh start from a fresh start God to believe this year. If you've been around this place, some of you might remember that I, I love golf. I love golf especially because then I can trap my friends in hanging out with me for four hours. When I'm playing with friends, friends, and trying to have a good time, I will often suggest that we take a mulligan or two. I mean, those are just a couple of do-overs in a tough game. You hit a lousy shot, then now with a mulligan you can retake that shot. Not just one shot per side, it's not like we're cheating or anything. I think we all, I think you'll agree, I think we all need mulligans, second chances, fresh starts from time to time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes this possible. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, we may also live new lives beginning here and now. God promises a fresh start by putting our faith in Jesus and his resurrection. So don't just look in your mind for the answers today. Search your heart to embrace the risen Jesus. Celebrate then the new life Jesus offers and live today in the hope of Jesus' loving, promised presence forever. Church, let's cry out to God to give us the faith that will transform our lives. Lives then to be used by God's Spirit to make a loving difference in this world. Will anyone give me an amen for that? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God, thank you for these hopeful words that draws us into a deeper understanding of your call upon our lives, mustering us, enabling us, empowering us, a faith that will help us to keep turning to you leaning toward you as you do your good work in us. Lord, hear our prayers as we cry them out to you. Give us the faith we need to be the people you call us to be. For we pray this in your name. Amen.
Thank you so much. Well, what better day to express our gratitude to God than Easter morning? Christ came as a baby, a baby of promise. Thought that's a wonderful day on Christmas. Uh, but Christ came to teach us and help us learn, set an example, and then die for us, and then amazingly rise again. So we express our gratitude to God in many ways. One of them is through giving. So we invite you to give now generously. The ushers will come with the plates. You can give online, text Meeting House to the number in your uh, bulletin, or there's a box in the commons where you can place your offerings. Let's pray. As I pray and just witness that amazing gift of the song, the chorale, the brass, all the voices in the congregation, those singing at home, we hope that you receive that, God, all the gifts that we've offered. We pray that you would lead us and guide us in a way that we would become even greater gift givers, recognizing all that we have received, all of what you've done in us, through us, for us. Help us to respond with a generosity that the world around us will take notice of and point them to you. So God, receive these offerings as we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with those words in your hand from the bulletin and we're singing together.
Paul, I think those additional Corral members really made the difference. I don't know. <laughs> Woo! That was amazing. That was amazing. And I will just tell you, as much as, you know, we all got to go and do stuff, I would encourage you to stay and listen to the postlude. It's that wonderful Easter postlude, and uh, Tom does a beautiful job with that, so I would encourage you to linger if you'd like. There will be coffee and donut holes. I mean, it's a chance for you to meet some people or greet some people or catch up with some old friends in the common as well. We are glad that you are here. Aren't you glad you were here? Yes. Amen, amen, amen. So often in life we are living in that Good Friday life. My, my friends, we are on this side of Easter now. We are on this side of understanding that God came to us and we know it in the resurrected Jesus. Let's live in the alleluia of these moments. We've been talking this whole month about crying out to God, sharing our hearts and our needs and our prayers and trusting that God hears us. Now we can cry out to God with an alleluia for God has heard our prayers and lives in our prayers and will walk with us as we cry out, trusting and living with God. Amen. 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 Go in God's peace now and forever. Amen and amen.